Dale? Well, welcome to the uh, best day of the week. Uh, when our kids were at home, sometime on Saturday, we would start saying, we all need to get ready tomorrow because tomorrow is the best day of the week. Uh, we get to be with our spiritual family, so we're grateful for you to be here. We're going to do one thing for a review, and then I'm going to take a slight due tier at the very beginning <clears throat> and actually take a verse that will be in the section Bill's going to cover next week. If you're at home, I'd like for you to turn to Romans 1 and Romans 16. If you're here, <clears throat> inside, and it's on the, the back of the, of the second page, you'll see opening, closing, and petition. So if you find that, then we're going to start with that and look at that here in just a second. <clears throat> One of the things that we always encourage people to do is that anytime you look, particularly at one of Paul's letters, then look at the opening part and read down until he says, either I want you to know, I do not want you to be ignorant, or as for you. And that is a very specific term where he trans transitions from the opening to the closing. And then you read the end, and I just wrote these down. In chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul speaks about the obedience of faith, for the sake of his name among all the nations. And then when you go to the end of the book in chapter 16, verse 26, he speaks about this mystery, which has been known to all nations to bring about the obedience of faith. And so when you look at this at the opening and the closing, one of the things that Paul is going to emphasize is that uh, his ministry as the apostle to the Gentiles is to bring about the obedience of faith of the nations. And what is significant, and we've looked at this culturally in terms of the events that took place, and we'll see this in a second. In 49, the Emperor Claudius had expelled all of the Jews from Rome, and we know that because Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla, and Luke just tells us in chapter 18 and verse 2 that they have been sent out of Rome because of the decree of Claudius, and so you have a church, and I'm going to use the term multicultural, meaning Gentile and Jew, that had been that way, and we don't know exactly when it started other than there are people from Rome at Pentecost in Acts 2, so it's very possible that people took the church and the gospel back as early as Acts 2. But next week, when Bill looks at this list, there's a list of 30 people's names in Romans 16 that Paul sends greetings to, and he's never been to this church. So think about that. Here are 30 different people that he's met somewhere on his journeys and somewhere in the different churches that are now worshiping in the church at Rome. And so a church, and I'm going to use our terms, the church that was multicultural, that has gone through a period of time where all the Jews, not by their choice, but by the emperor, have <laughs> been evicted. And here we are about six years later, and they are coming back together, and there are real challenges in terms of unity, in terms of brotherhood. And today, the description, parallel to some verses in Corinthians, is he will even refer to people who are the weak and the strong. So you have people who've been together, they've separated, and again, been a little bit tongue-in-cheek. <clears throat> For those of us who are Gentiles, it was really, really nice to have those picky Jews for, gone for a while because we could have bacon in our baked beans and no one turned up their nose. We could bring ham, other stuff. And now the Jews have come back and this, this cultural clash is so much the background of what's taking place. <clears throat> but the other thing right in the middle of that, when you come across this wonderful term, I urge you, I beg you, I beseech you, like for example, 1 Corinthians 1.10, I urge you that you all be united, that you speak the same things. Ephesians 4 and verse 1, I urge you to walk worthy of your calling. And I wouldn't do this with your grandchildren, but most of you will understand. I think of grandma's T-post clothesline, and the opening and the closing is the obedience of faith of the nations, and the string that runs between is I want you to present yourselves as a living sacrifice. 
do not be conformed to this world. And when I read this, I'm thinking of Paul saying, now to the Jews, don't you be so focused on the things that are clean and unclean that you can't fellowship with the Gentiles. And Gentiles, you be mindful of the scruples and the belief that the Jews have. <clears throat> Don't be shaped by this present world's way of thinking. <clears throat> Metamorphosis. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this is the challenge to both of the groups that are here in the church. But from this, and this is where I want to take a bit of a detour and we'll just do this very quickly. Philip Slate was just a wonderful influence in our lives and he had worked with the, with the church in London uh, through the 60s. And you think, how international is a place like London? Um, visiting with him recently, he has asked the current preacher, uh, currently there are 30 nations in the Wembley Church in London. So you stop and think, how do you do church with people from 30 different nations? And we're going to look at another example here in a little bit. But one of the things that Philip talked to us about is that if you had a good English teacher, she would say, what are those primary questions? Who, what, when, where, why, how, and how much? And he said, of all of those, one of the most important things for us as Christians is the one why. If we have a good why for why we're reaching out, why we're trying to teach people who are lost, why are we trying to bring people out of darkness into light? He said, a good why will help us and carry us, and I just gave some things. It purifies our motives. Why are we doing this? It also helps us to persevere. I think of church work like the tide. Sometimes the tide's coming in, sometimes the tide's going out. You don't have control over either, either one of them. And sometimes people are coming into the Lord, sometimes people aren't, and why is very important during those times. It helps us keep on keeping on when someone says no. I've studied with people for a year or 18 months, and they finally come to the point of saying, we really appreciate your time, thank you for this, I really don't want to make these changes in my life. And a part of you can just get really discouraged because you've worked, you've tried, you've prayed, but... You've done your part before God because you gave them the opportunity to make a valid decision, either yes or no. And so when people say no, a good why is very, very helpful. And why also helps us keep our focus on God rather than ourselves. So if you look at the very back page, and that's why I did a blank so you could just turn this over. When you read this petition in Romans 12, I want you to present yourselves as a living sacrifice and think about what this would say especially to people who are Jews but the people who are Gentiles are very familiar because there's all kinds of pagan sacrifices as well and just start thinking along this line what are the types of animals the types of things that are sacrificed oh things that have quality and Paul's going to say earlier I want you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice <clears throat> our last book in the old testament malachi 1 and 8 and i just shudder when i look at this they're offering the blind and the crippled and the lame and boy the, the pro, god and the prophet are both upset you know it's like what are you doing oh we're going to offer a sacrifice to god well here's one bless his heart we had about 100 sheep by the time that i went to oklahoma christian and bless his heart we had one that just had a crooked neck and he just looked around like this all the time, and it, 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 it was how he was born, bless his heart. But what the Jews are saying is that, oh, here's one who's crippled, here's one who's blind, here's one who's lame, and rather than offering the firstborn and the best, yes, we're going to offer a sacrifice to God, but let's go offer this crippled one. And you can imagine how God feels about that. And what's significant is that something that is offered as a sacrifice is something of value. And so when you read Romans 15, and I'm down in verse 15, the grace given me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. And you notice he says, I am the apostle to the Gentiles. And notice this, in the priestly service of the gospel, that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And look at the contrast. 
For hundreds of years, and at least all the way back to Mount Sinai, 1,500 years, people had been offering animals, lambs, bulls, other things at different times, and they had been offering, and I'm going to use the term a dead sacrifice and that you kill it, and the value of the offering of the life and the blood and the other things was a part of the sacrifice. And so what is the challenge in Romans 12? It's one thing to present a dead animal as a sacrifice. It's another thing to present yourself as a living sacrifice. See the contrast? The people have been accustomed to offering a dead animal, killing the animal, and that was a part of the sacrifice, the life and the blood and the other things, and that was something that was acceptable as an animal sacrifice. And so Paul is saying, well, instead of, and let me say it this way, it's a whole lot easier to run out to the pen and grab a sheep and offer him than it is to offer yourself. And using that sacrificial terminology, then Paul uses the term, I want you, rather than just thinking, oh, externally, I'm going to offer up a live animal, we will kill it, it will be dead, da 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 Well, Paul's saying what God wants is not a dead animal, but a living person. I want you to make the sacrifices in your life so that you can be a living sacrifice. That's Romans 12. Here's one of the great motives for reaching out. And the same way that a family would bring a lamb for an offering, then Paul is saying, I am bringing the Gentiles to God as a priestly offering in the service of the gospel. And listen to the terms again. A minister of Christ Jesus, this is Romans 15, 15 following, in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And when you understand that everything in this book is the attempt to bring together Jews and Gentiles back into one body, two things are being said, at least that come to my mind when I'm looking at this. One, the inclusion of the Gentiles in the church is as much a part of the plan as the Jews. And Paul is going to quote very specific scriptures that this has been God's plan. And remember when God came to Abraham? Let's go out and count the stars. And Abraham, if you can count the stars, so shall your children be. And I want you to be a blessing to all nations. And that's why when you read the 15 nations in Acts chapter 2, that blessing promised 2,000 years earlier with Abraham is going to begin and will continue on until Jesus comes back. And so, bringing the Gentiles into the church, helping people to come out of darkness into light, helping people come to know God, then in the same way that, that the Jews and Gentiles are familiar with people offering an animal for a sacrifice, Paul says, I think of this as the priestly service of offering the Gentiles back to God. Living sacrifice. And what are the terms that he uses? Oh, this is acceptable. This is sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And the reason I wanted just to, to start with this in terms, and this, we'll just do these others very quickly. Isn't that a wonderful motive to be reaching out to people who are lost? And thinking every time someone becomes a Christian, then again, rather than offering an animal that will be dead, then we work and teach and help these people come out of darkness into light, and in the same way we offer them back to God as this acceptable sacrifice. We'll do these others very quickly, and I'll leave you to read these because we want to get back into our section. But I think another great reason for reaching out is just to honor the memory and the teaching of Jesus. There's just a real sense that he left heaven, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And you'll hear these terms, Luke 19, 10, he came to seek and save the lost. As he talks to them in Mark 16, it's as you go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And for you and I today, that may be going into Sam's or Walmart. That may be just in our daily life. As you go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. The equivalent of the Great Commission in Luke, I want repentance for the forgiveness of sins 
to be proclaimed among the nations. The third one, and I love this one, as more people become Christians, the amount of praise being given to God increases. And we'll mention this a little bit later. In the, in the early 80s, we moved, we were in Sydney, three and a half million at the time, and we moved to the far southwest part. And before we moved there, uh, there weren't any New Testament Christians worshiping there. At one time, there's a group of 50. At one time, there's a group of 80 and even a little bit more. But you stop and think, just on a week-to-week -week basis, the level of praise being offered back to God increases every time new people become Christians. So notice 2 Corinthians 4.15. This is for your sake. As grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. One of the early things that, I, and I, I still think about this a lot, one of the early things that I talked about during the Lord's Supper was this, and it's so true, every Sunday, someone will take the Lord's Supper for the last time. Every Sunday, somebody will take the Lord's Supper for the first time. And that's just how it's going to be until Jesus comes back. And I had a procedure recently where they went in and just did some examination and stuff. And, you know, not neurotic, don't, don't just worry about it, but you just stop and think, there's going to be a time that each of us will die. It's appointed to man wants to die and then comes to judgment. And I thought, well, what if Wednesday night is the last class that I teach? And for every one of us, we will do the things we love to do or even hate to do for the last time. And every Sunday, today, somebody will take the Lord's Supper for the first time. And someone for the last time. But as more and more people become Christians, then the volume of praise, sacrifice, worship that is offered to God increases. So every time we help someone come out of darkness into light, then we increase the volume of praise that's being offered to God. When you look at number four, I call this the vision of heaven. Here's Revelation 14 and 4. These have been <clears throat> redeemed from among mankind. And then I love this one in Revelation 5 and 9. Here's the lamb looking as if he was slain. And notice the people, every tribe, every language or tongue, every people and every nation. And this is the description of the citizens of heaven, people from every tribe, tongue, people and nation. First Peter 2, 9 and 10, here's again this Old Testament terminology and you have terms like a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you may show forth, proclaim the excellence of him. And again, as we evangelize, there are more people who devote their, their lives to the praise and glory of God. All of these are a lesson within themselves, but this is one of my favorite lessons and haven't done it here. <clears throat> I love a lesson which I just described the dream of God. And very early, God will say, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And you will hear that refrain. It's about 18 times through Scripture. And even when you come to the book of Revelation, God is so pleased because finally, for the saints and the servants who are the citizens of heaven, I will be their God, and they will be my people. And every time one more person comes to the Lord we have increased the number of people who belong to that group. <clears throat> the final one is just to give glory to God in the church and in Christ Jesus. And one of the things that I'm just so convinced about, and I talk with our interns and younger ministers about, uh, th this is the Lord's church. And, and I understand, but I've talked with guys and talk about, you know, either my elders or this and that, and I says, I understand, but there's a real sense they're God's elders. Those of you who know my wife, who is the Israelite in whom there's no guile, uh, we had a youth minister for a while when our kids were with us, and he was talking about my kids this, and my kids this, and my kids that. And very quietly, you know, she's not rude, but Sheila went up and she said, I didn't realize you were there when my kids were born. Uh, when's the last time you've been at a birthday party? 
Uh, when's the last time you've been at Christmas? She said, I just want to make one thing clear. These are my kids, but they're actually not mine. They're God's. And you're working with God's kids. I would just appreciate if you don't call them my kids because you didn't bring any of them into the world. <laughs> and it's a matter of perspective. But I see things totally different when I think this is the Lord's church. And what we do when we add to the number of people, then we bring glory both to the church and also to Christ. Okay, let's go to the front. <clears throat> One of the things that's talked about as you read through this section, and I just picked out these words, the strong and the weak. And the irony is that sometimes the strong are actually, well, let me say it this way, the people who think they're strong are actually the weak. And the people sometimes they accuse to be the weak are actually the strong. And we're going to see this in matters of culture and in matters of opinion that, that come about. So if you notice down on number two, Paul is going to say to both sides, and we'll stick with Jews and Gentiles, I want you to accept one another without passing judgment on disputable matters. And anticipate. There are some things, and I'm gonna, I use the terms black and white and gray, but you can use other terms. But there are some things that are right in every culture and every situation. There are some things that are wrong in every culture and every situation. And then there's a big area in the middle that I put under the area both of culture and conscience. And there are things that one person may be able to do that another person can't in terms of both their, their conscience and their conditioning. And so <clears throat> Paul is saying to both groups, who have different perspectives on food, they have different perspective on holy days, they have different perspectives even on fellowship. I want you to accept one another without passing judgment on disputable matters. <clears throat> so here's three things you're not to do, and this is in chapter 14 starting verse two. Do not despise or condemn the weak. In other words, there's some people who just can't do some things. Don't despise them. We'll come back to that. Two, two, do nothing either to offend or to destroy them. You know, spiritually, don't stick your foot out and trip somebody that you know this is something that they're going to struggle with. And do not do things just to please yourself, but follow the example of Christ. And the goal, again, is for Jews and Gentiles to gather together and offer up praise to God with one voice. My observation is that up to 90% of the, of the problems we have in the church are most often over opinion and less often over just purely on doctrine. And there are times that something doctrinally comes up. But if you, if you have been in a really good church dispute, a church fight, and two groups really start getting at each other, it typically starts as something with the opinion, but at some point, one or both of them are going to make it scriptural to give more weight to what they want done. And what is so important is that we have to be able to work through issues that are not the right and wrong, that are not the essential matters of faith, and be able to work together and to help each other to grow as Christians, even though we don't always agree. So here's some things that Paul says, and this is 14.1. Do not pass judgment on one another. As for one who is weak, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything. The weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one despise the one who abstains, and let, let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. I'm sorry. I've had vegetarians tell me that I am a subpar Christian because I eat meat. I push delete, 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 don't say that, don't say that, don't say that. Uh, what did God ask the priest to do with part of the sacrifices? Oh, the priest were to eat meat from the sacrifices. If you choose to do that, for whatever reason, I don't have any quibbles with that. But please, if you are a devoted, 
committed vegetarian, do not look down your nose and condemn anyone who eats chicken or, or who eats meat occasionally. And these are the types of things that are going to come up. <clears throat> this is a very personal thing in this next verse. Th there are some people who feel like we are the appointed judges for what is going on in, in the fellowships. And Tim and our elders have occasionally gotten a letter, why did you do this or about this and the other? And I'm sorry, there's a few times that someone has written to me about da 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 and I just send them back one verse, Romans 14, 4. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master, the Lord, that he will stand or fall, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. I don't answer, I don't quibble, I don't fight about what they're all troubled about, but I've had people say, you know, da da da, or you're having someone come, da 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 da, and my typical response, if I respond, sometimes I don't even do that, <clears throat> is just to send them Romans 14 4. Who are you to pass judgment on another? <clears throat> when you look at this, for the weak, don't despise them, don't pass judgment. And you have the same thing with different days that people think are more important. So if you turn the page, this is 14.7. <clears throat> none of us lives to himself. None of us dies to himself. Christ died that he might be the Lord of the living and the dead. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every knee shall bow. Every sh tongue shall confess. Each of us will give an account to himself to God especially in matters of judgment, especially in matters of conscience and opinion, Paul is saying, don't press your conscience, don't press your opinion, and I would even say your culture on other people that they must do and believe exactly like you do. And here it comes, 14.3, 13. Do not pass judgment on one another. <clears throat> do not be a stumbling block. And look at 14.15. If your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ came. The kingdom is not physical things, eating and drinking, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the spirit. And let's pursue what makes for peace and mutual edification. <clears throat> 1420, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. And again, here's this thing with stumbling. And for whatever does not proceed of faith is sin, 1423. <clears throat> and then here it comes in chapter 15. He says, uh, those of you who are strong, and this is following the example of Christ, then you have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. Each of us should please his brother to help build him up. And then at the very end of this, you'll see, <clears throat> may the God of endurance, this is 15 and five, and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with each other in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 15.7, Romans. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. <clears throat> in 12 years, and I mentioned this, in 12 years in Sydney, I studied with one person who'd ever read the Bible. And just stop and think about that. Only with one person that, never read the, that had ever read the Bible. You have to go way, way, way back to start developing faith and for them to start understanding. And you can imagine the different types of lifestyle that these people are involved with because if they've never read the Bible, they don't go to church, then they're just living in the world. <clears throat> we had a wonderful young lady <clears throat> named Wendy who became a Christian very, very talented, she was British, uh, a commercial artist. I knew this, but didn't say anything. She made a really, really, really good living designing wine labels, <clears throat> labels for wine bottles. That's not like quite working in a brothel or something else, but I didn't say anything to her. And about six months after she became a Christian, she said, we need to talk. And so we sat down and she said, you know, before I became a Christian, this never really crossed my mind 
But now that I become a Christian, I'm beginning to wonder, does God really want me contributing to the alcohol industry by designing labels? And I said, well, this is something you'll have to kind of work through, but well done, you're doing that. And over a period of time, about two months, she came to the conviction, as a Christian, I can no longer do this. She has never, ever made the same amount of money at any other job that she lost by doing that. What would have happened if the day after she became a Christian, I'd come in and said, whoops, got to drop that, can't do that, leave that alone. <clears throat> and here it is. Everyone has to live and work according to their own faith, according to their own conscience. But as she grew as a Christian, she came to that conviction herself. And she would be the first to tell you, I have never recovered financially from where I had been before, but I wouldn't trade the finances for my faith in Christ. And those are the kinds of things when people come completely out of darkness, there's all kinds of lifestyle things that they have to deal with and to work with. <clears throat> and Paul is going to remind them in 15.9 that the Gentiles might glorify God. When you read down through verse 13, here are quotations from Psalms, Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Isaiah, that all through the Old Testament, yes, the Gentiles are become Christians. God wants all nations to come in. <clears throat> and then he says, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. So here's some questions. How do the weak and strong get along? And again, these are oftentimes matters of opinion. And what I want you to see is that I, I put these terms down. There are things that I use from 1 to 10. There are things on either side that are going to be right and wrong every time. <clears throat> but where we have the most of our discussion and trouble are the ones in the middle that have to do both with culture and conscience and just general experiences. But look at some things that Paul has summarized. 14.1, the one who is weak in the faith, welcome him. Do not pass judgment on one another, 14.13. 14.19, let's pursue for peace and mutual upbuilding. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. We should please our neighbor for his good to build him up and welcome one another. <clears throat> I love this quotation. Sometimes civil people are not committed, and sometimes committed people are not civil. And that's just something that's just a reality of people in a larger group trying to live and trying to, to work together. <clears throat> if you look at the last page, the one thing I want to I want to just summarize with a couple of things. There is always a challenge for people in different situations being able to get along. And for the Jewish believers, with all of their background and the clean and the unclean, <clears throat> there are times that coming to church is just going to make their skin crawl. <clears throat> Do you remember in, in Acts chapter 10? <clears throat> Peter's been a Christian for a decade, and the, the, and the voice says, rise and kill and eat. And he says, nope, I've never touched anything unclean. And so for people who are Jews to come worship with a group of Gentiles, there are just going to be some, some real challenges. And then for those of us that are Gentiles, it's going to be easy to say, well, those picky, picky Jews, and they're always criticizing, they're always making trouble. And, and you can see there's going to be a challenge for both whoever is the strong and whoever is the weak to be able to accept each other. Uh, Kent and Nancy, brother and sister-in-law, we met with Charlie and Debbie Powell this week, and I just said, I knew we had people from five continents. Let's just list from memory the nations that were worshiping in one church within a short period of time. China, Chile, Colombia, Denmark, El Salvador, England, Fiji, France, Germany, Ireland, Lebanon, Macedonia, Malaysia, New Zealand, Rhodesia, Russia, Scotland, Singapore, Sri Lanka, and USA. 
Can I say United Nations? What is the culture of a church that very quickly has people from 20 nations in it? My niece went to a high school and there were typically between 72 to 77 nations in her high school. She's the only American. Our son is in a soccer league of eight teams. He is the only person that has a Sunday morning commitment. And what I want you to think about is this, is that sometimes people think of scriptural things in terms of exclusive, one side or another side. With the experience of being in such an international church, I tend to think of things that are inclusive. And the last two things I want to mention are this. We cannot let a person's conscience dictate everything that a church does. Of course, this is more amplified in a smaller church. And my expression was, we can't let the tail wag the dog. And so there may be times that I abstain from doing something because of my conscience, but I can't put my conscience as the guide for the whole church. And when you have new Christians, this is a really challenging matter. And here's our closing statement. <clears throat> Very quickly, as we have people from every inhabited continent, <laughs> we have such diversity of food, diversity of culture, uh, we had a motto, we had a slogan, <clears throat> and we used it over and over and again. What we have in common in Christ is more important than our cultural differences. And every time we had a fellowship, every time we had an activity, if we just focused on our differences, when you've got people from 20 different nations, then our differences are many. But remember when Paul says, accept one another? Do not pass judgment on one another. And one of our themes was, in coming out of the teaching of Romans 14 and 15, what we have in common in Christ is more important than our differences. And by the grace of God, let's keep bringing people out of darkness into light. Let's keep helping people to become the sons and daughters of God, that the praise and the glory of God will continue to increase in our generation.